This meeting will come to order. This is a special meeting of the University of Michigan's Faculty Senate that's been called for the purpose of hearing the Senate's annual Davis Market Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. I'm Charles Smith, Chair of the Faculty Senate. The intention of the Senate Assembly when it established this lecture series in 1990 was that the annual lecture should be a constant reminder of the value and the vulnerability of academic and intellectual freedom. This concern, stated during the first lecture delivered by Robert M. O'Neill in early 1991, has been restated at every lecture since that time. With the growing corporatization of higher education so evident not only here in Ann Arbor, but on campuses across our nation, the threat to academic and intellectual freedom is perhaps greater today than at any time in our nation's history. Our first order of business is for me to introduce the president of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund. When the lecture, uh, when the first lecture was delivered in 1991, Peggy J. Hollingsworth was chair of the Faculty Senate. The Senate Assembly also created the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund in 1991 and Dr. Hollingsworth became its first president. During the past 18 years, she has worked to see that this lecture series was not only sustained but grew in prominence as an annual event on the university calendar, in part through her role as president of the fund. For her contributions to faculty governance at the University of Michigan, she has received a number of awards that include the prestigious Academic Women's Caucus Sarah Goddard Power Award, given to women who have made outstanding contributions to better the status of women at the University of Michigan, the University of Michigan President's Medallion, the University of Michigan Association of Black Professionals and Administrators High Achievement Award, the University of Michigan, uh, uh, <clears throat> let's see, Alumni Association Special Appreciation Award, the University of Michigan's Alumni Association Appreciation Award, I mentioned that, the Faculty Governance Award, and this year, she received the Jackie Lawson Memorial Faculty Governance Award, which recognizes her efforts to promote through good faculty governance the missions of the University of Michigan on its three campuses. Our tradition is for the president of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund to make remarks at the beginning of each lecture. So I will now ask her to come to the podium. Dr. Hollingsworth. On behalf of the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund, I would like to welcome you to the 17th Annual University of Michigan Senate's Davis Margaret Nickerson Lecture on Academic and Intellectual Freedom. We once again have the pleasure of being joined by the surviving member of our three honorees after whom this lecture is named, H. Chandler Davis, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics from the University of Toronto. Chandler is not only a distinguished mathematician, but a talented poet and essayist. Chandler, would you please stand so we might welcome you. As many here are aware, two years ago, the regents of the University of Michigan created the Davis Market Nickerson Visiting Professorship. We hope that in the near future, we will have with us the first recipient of that professorship. In the meantime, the regents have just named Michigan Professor Alan M. Wall the H. Chandler Davis Collegiate Professor of English and American Culture, a chair that he will occupy for the next five years. It is also my pleasure at this time to welcome United States District Judge Avon Cohn, who presented the 1996 Davis Market Nickerson Lecture. Judge Cohn, would you please stand? Shortly after the University of Michigan Senate Assembly established this annual lecture, it created the Academic Freedom Lecture Fund. The fund is an independent, tax-exempt organization that supports public lectures on academic freedom wherever they might be given. It relies on contributions from the public in order to continue to support such activities. 
In addition to contributions from individuals such as those here today, the fund since its creation has received financial support from the Academic Freedom Fund of the National American Association of University Professors, AAUP, from the Professors Fund for Educational Issues, affiliated with the Michigan Conference of the AAUP, from several departments and administrative offices of the University of Michigan, and from public and private foundations. The fund has an advisory board comprised of distinguished scholars and leading authorities on First Amendment rights. Members of the fund's advisory board have a central role in maintaining and enhancing the quality of the annual lecture that goes beyond the raising of the necessary funds. They often suggest the names of scholars who will be selected to deliver the lecture, and some help to persuade an individual, once selected, to accept our invitation to give the lecture. A number of members of the advisory board are former lecturers. But this year, for the first time, the Senate Assembly Selection Committee has chosen someone who is already a member of the fund's advisory board to deliver the annual lecture. This year's lecturer, Nadine Strosen, long a strong and dedicated supporter of the annual lecture and the fund, has since 1991 been president of the American Civil Liberties Union, an organization that is one of our nation's staunchest defenders of academic and intellectual freedom. I am so pleased that she has agreed to deliver the lecture this year. As the Faculty Senate's annual lecture has moved to fill a central role in the university's academic year, public interest in the lecture has grown immensely. For many years, the annual lecture has been rebroadcast on the university's public television station, Channel 22. In addition, this year the lecture, lecture is being simulcast at the University of Michigan Detroit Center for those who are in Detroit and is being recorded by the University of Michigan Alumni Association as a podcast for free electronic distribution by Alumni Association podcasts. Thus, your friends, colleagues, and students who are not here today will have ample opportunity to hear this important lecture by Professor Strosen. Many are responsible for the success of this lecture. I would like to thank members of the Faculty Senate Office, its director, Thomas Schneider, and especially Linda Carr, for their efforts in assisting to organize this year's lecture. Patrick Murphy, Scott Mann, and their colleagues from Michigan Productions are here again this year to record the lecture that we subsequently will be able to see on Channel 22. For the sixth year, Brent Futrell has created an impressive poster to advertise the lecture and the posters have been distributed across our campus by social work graduate student Carrie Krapel. And Colleen Mantel, an LSNA English Honors undergraduate student, is assisting us here today. The title of this year's lecture, Defending Freedom Even for the Thoughts We Hate, brought to mind a quotation from a 19th century preacher, Tyrone Edwards, whose avocation was compiling books of quotable material. Quote, Thoughts lead on to purposes. Purposes go forth in action. Actions form habits. Habits decide character. And character fixes our destiny." End quote. I'm delighted that Paul Caron, our former provost and now librarian and dean of libraries, who has been very supportive of this lecture series, is here today to introduce our speaker. Paul, thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Welcome all. Um, the story of how this lecture came to be has been already discussed and is in the program um, and um, uh, doesn't require repeating, although it actually does require repeating. So it's one that is worth reflecting on um, at your leisure over the weekend. Um, there are a few points I want to take from the story before I introduce our speaker. And I'm going to repeat myself, uh, recalling something that I said several years ago when I introduced the speaker at this lecture. In the material that had been prepared for me to draw my remarks from that time, when you're provost, that happens. When you're librarian, you've got to write your own stuff. Um, 
much was made of the extraordinary scientific contributions of Davis, Markard, and Nickerson. With all respect to them, and uh, especially to Professor Davis, who was, of course, here, I said then, and I want to repeat, that such information and evaluation is entirely irrelevant to the issue at hand. Indeed, it makes the wrong point. Academic freedom in particular, freedom of speech more broadly, are not justified by specific cases in which ideas or people thought to be dangerous by someone turned out to be useful. Some ideas are good and useful. Some are crazy. Some are dangerous. Some provide great human benefit. Some are broadly are barely worth the time it takes to dismiss them. But we don't base our notions of protected speech on a forecast of how useful or consequential the content of any particular speech or any academic work will be. Hence, we cannot say that Davis, Markard, and Nickerson were unjustly treated because it turned out that they did good work. Their treatment would have been just as unjust, if you will forgive me, if they turned out to be wrong in every scientific particular of everything that they did, or if they had gone on to do nothing at all. Nadine Strasser will be able to speak far more eloquently than I can about the principles underlying free speech. But I do note from my new perspective in the library that lots of people who claim to hold to the principle of free speech find exceptions when something that they care about is at risk. Not librarians, by the way, lots of other people. <laughs> All sorts of opportunities to censor, to withdraw material and the like come to the intention, attention of the library really quite frequently. And it's obvious to us that the right answer to these questions is no. It's not so obvious to people who you would expect to know better. A principle, of course, isn't much of a principle if it's only honored when it's consonant with one's policy positions and emotions. It begins to do heavy lifting when it hurts to honor it. And I think that will be the topic of much of what will, will follow. Let me briefly introduce our speaker. There's a long discussion of her in, again in the program. Um, Nadine Strassen is professor of law uh, at, uh, at New York Law School um, and has done many things, most notably become president, most notably for these purposes, become president of the ACLU, which I'll talk about in a minute. I do have to note that in the materials about her, um, she, she moves up very, very nicely. She, she starts off as, as, um, the, as among the 350 women who changed the world, and then she moves up to an elite 100, drops back to 200 most influential, and then finishes strongly um, at the top 100 again. So, so now, of course, top 100 is consistent with all of those other numbers, so one just doesn't know, uh, and maybe if there were a top 50 or a top 10, but, but we don't have those sorts of inf information. Um, it seems to me most appropriate that the president of the American Civil Liberties Union be called upon to give this talk. The American Civil Liberties Union has, um, for as long as I can remember, and of course for much longer, uh, um, provided, presented us with extraordinary courage around issues that many people find to be troubling. And so I think its leaders, leaders surely also has that courage. And courage is, and it is the courage of conviction that is at the heart of what we care about here and must care about uh, as, as an academic institution that takes ourselves seriously. And so it is really an enormous, tremendous pleasure for me to introduce to you our speaker today, Nadine Strassen, President of the American Civil Liberties Union. Thank you so much, Paul, for that gracious introduction, and thanks to the audience for that warm welcome. I am so honored to participate in this very important lecture series, and I'm so grateful to all of the supporters for your commitment to First Amendment freedoms. 
I owe a special thanks to Peggy and Tad for their great work in arranging my visit here, including by helping me to formulate a lecture topic that they thought would be most pertinent to this forum. Now, obviously, the topic we chose is a very broad one. We decided that I should touch on a broad array of points in the hope of provoking your thoughts, not to mention provoking your questions and comments. Um, in short, I'm going to have to give what Adelaide Stevenson once called a fan dance talk. And the younger audience members can infer the nature of this now archaic art form through Stevenson's comparison. He said that the point of the talk, like the point of the fan, is not to cover the subject, but rather to draw attention to it. <laughs> I, I am so inspired by the 1990 University of Michigan Senate Assembly resolution that established the lecture series, and I'm so honored that Chandler Davis, uh, who is one of the inspiring forces for this, is here. I, and in particular, the recognition of this resolution that academic and intellectual freedom, quote, are vulnerable to the fads, fashions, social movements, and mass fears that threaten to still dissent and to censure carriers of unpopular ideas. Now, of course, it's always easier to recognize these factors with 2020 hindsight. And it's always tempting to distinguish today's pressing concerns as allegedly being so different from past concerns and so much more dangerous with the result that we can too readily conclude that today's forms of censorship are justified. For example, many government officials and members of the public have maintained for the past six years that we are now living in a new post 9-11 world, hardly a brave new world, I might add, in which all freedoms, including First Amendment freedoms, are said to be luxuries we can no longer afford. In fact, there have been so many First Amendment casualties of the war on terror that the ACLU recently issued a special report about them. It's modeled after the Declaration of Independence to highlight the importance of returning to the first principles on which this nation was founded. As in the original declaration, this one lists specific grievances, in this case, 16 major categories. And I would like to read from this new declaration just a few of the post-9-11 First Amendment infractions by our government. It ignores its representative mandate by governing in the shadows. It maintains a surveillance society through warrantless wiretapping, opening mail, and spying. It silences dissent. It overclassifies, reclassifies, and impedes the lawful declassification of documents. It prevents soldiers from communicating with their families and prosecutes their lawful speech. It silences whistleblowers and it prosecutes the press for revealing illegal government programs. Likewise, ever since the advent of the internet, there have been political and public pressures to curb online expression because of the allegedly unique dangers that this new medium is said to pose. Indeed, just a couple weeks ago, the ACLU filed yet another brief in our long-standing challenge to a federal internet censorship law that dates way back to 1998 that has been vigorously defended ever since by first the Clinton administration and now the Bush administration, including through two Supreme Court decisions so far. And in the entire United States Congress, only a handful of members voted against this cyber censorship law on either side of the political aisle since again, all of them concluded that the internet is so different and so much more dangerous than all prior media. In short, too many of us tend to labor under what I think of as historical hubris. We assume that we, in our times, are facing unique new dangers, which uniquely warrant restrictions on freedoms including First Amendment freedoms. So recognizing that tendency, that pattern, I think that we should compensate with a strong dose of historical humility. Accordingly, I think that we should look back on the McCarthy era events that gave rise to this lecture series, not with smug self-assurance that they certainly would not have happened on our watch, 
but rather I think we should look back on them with humility and modesty. And we should ask ourselves what blind spots we now have, allowing us to accept First Amendment infractions for reasons that a future generation will look back on, the way your 1990 resolution described the Cold War climate as, again, passing fads, fashions, social movements, and mass fears that unjustifiably threaten freedom. As the great judge Learned Hand said in 1944, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. And I agree with Paul that the courage of our convictions is vitally important. Uh, but I think we also have to temper that with some modesty. And that same important insight was echoed just a few years ago by current Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, who expressly called for a constant reevaluation and expansion of the general concept of liberty that is protected in the Constitution's due process clauses. Justice Kennedy's stirring words are especially noteworthy because he is a conservative Republican who was appointed to the court by another conservative Republican, Ronald Reagan. And I say these facts are noteworthy because they illustrate an important general point, contrary to stereotypes. And that is that support for First Amendment and other freedoms crosses all party and ideological lines. And that's also true for opposition to these freedoms, which is why the ACLU has always been staunchly nonpartisan. We never support or oppose any official candidate or group. Rather, we criticize or praise each of them on an issue by issue basis. And I can assure you, there is no individual and no group with either a 100% or a 0% uh, civil liberties rating. All are positive on some civil liberties issues, including free speech issues, and all are also negative on some. Again, these important general points are well illustrated by Anthony Kennedy, that conservative Republican Catholic justice. I'd like to read you his ringing endorsement of an evolving, dynamic concept of constitutionally protected liberty that is stereotypically but inaccurately associated with liberal justices. As Justice Kennedy declared, had those who drew and ratified the due process clauses known the components of liberty in its manifold possibilities, they would have been more specific. They did not presume to have this insight. They knew times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper in fact serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. So in this spirit of trying to see past our own historical blinders, Peggy and Tad agreed with me that I should try to challenge all of us to move beyond our own comfort zones, to re-examine our own preconceptions about what ideas or expression are beyond the pale, if any. The ACLU strives to defend all fundamental freedoms, including First Amendment freedoms for all people, regardless of who they are and regardless of what they believe or what they say. And now I hasten to add that I do practice what Learned Hand and Anthony Kennedy preached in terms of self-questioning. So I'm hardly contending that the ACLU has gotten it exactly right in every single one of the countless cases or controversies in which we've been involved all over the country for almost 90 years now. But I am enthusiastically endorsing the ACLU's goal of neutrality and the many situations in which we have furthered that goal, including by regularly defending rights even for people and groups who advocate ideas that are antithetical to our own civil libertarian views and who in fact exercise their free speech rights to attack the ACLU itself. This concept of viewpoint neutrality or content neutrality as the courts call it is a bedrock of First Amendment law to quote the Supreme Court. It bars the government from punishing any expression based on its content or viewpoint, the ideas expressed, no matter how hated or how hateful 
those ideas might be. And it's that bedrock principle, of course, that is incorporated in the title of my talk, crafted with the assistance of Peggy and Tad. That title alludes specifically to a famous statement of this cardinal neutrality principle by the great justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And by the way, speaking of neutrality and nonpartisanship, Holmes also embodies those themes. Both conservatives and liberals regularly claim Oliver Wendell Holmes as one of theirs. And I'm agnostic on that debate, but I am sure that both camps in it would agree that Holmes was certainly a great advocate of free speech and individual freedom more generally, as evidenced by this famous statement, which I'll now quote. If there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Now, consistent with this core principle, the Supreme Court has protected speech that conveys ideas that are offensive and hateful to many, if not most, Americans. For example, burning an American flag or burning a cross. The content neutrality principle reflects the philosophy that the appropriate response to speech with which we disagree is not censorship, but rather counter-speech. The Supreme Court eloquently endorsed this counter-speech approach in its flag-burning decisions. The court acknowledged the flag's special symbolic importance and hence the special offense that is caused by burning it. The court then went on to say, the way to preserve the flag's special role is not to punish those who feel differently, it is to persuade them that they are wrong. We can imagine no more appropriate response to burning a flag than waving one's own. No better way to counter a flag burner's message than by saluting the flag that burns. So let me cite just one recent example now of how the ACLU has implemented this essential free speech principle of content neutrality. The ACLU long has been at the forefront of the struggle to end discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but we still defend the First Amendment rights of those who hold very different views on these issues, including the Reverend Fred Phelps and his Westboro Baptist Church based in Kansas. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with Phelps or his church, their religious philosophy is summed up by their website address, namely www.godhatesfagsoneword.org. Now, Reverend Phelps and his church have been in the news lately because of their strident protests at military funerals all over the country, including right here in Michigan. Uh, you saw that there was a jury verdict against them recently in Baltimore. They claim that U.S. servicemen are dying in Iraq and elsewhere because of God's anger at our country's alleged tolerance of homosexuals, uh, their word, and I say alleged tolerance since our government, in fact, continues to discriminate against LGBT individuals in many ways, including by ex completely excluding them from the military. So. The Reverend Phelps' targeting of the military is ironic, but in any event, in this context, as in all others, the ACLU enforces the core content neutrality principle. The government may enforce content neutral rules, what we lawyers call time, place, and manner rules. For example, all speakers could be required to maintain a certain distance from funerals or to comply with certain limits on loudness. However, the government may not single out the Westboro Baptist Church protesters for special regulation based on disapproval of their message. Recently, both the federal government and many states have passed laws to deal with the military funeral protests. Many of these new laws are permissible, content neutral, time, place, and manner restrictions. I've looked at the Michigan statute. It seems to be in that category. However, some laws are not. Some target the viewpoint. And the ACLU has actually been representing the Reverend Phelps and his church in challenging some of these laws, which unduly suppress their First Amendment rights. In fact, one federal judge recently agreed with us that the Kentucky law that limits funeral protests goes too far and struck it down. I take special pride in the ACLU's viewpoint neutrality in these cases since the Westboro Baptist Church has so strongly attacked the ACLU itself, and indeed, it has attacked yours truly, personally. 
Uh, several years ago, I was speaking in Kansas, and members of the Westboro Baptist Church picketed uh, to protest. The messages on their picket signs were intended to be insulting, but I actually took them as backhanded compliments. Uh, one of the signs denounced the ACLU as the nation's number one fag lobby, which made me very proud. Uh, and my favorite sign in that demonstration was based on our acronym. Now, ACLU, of course, stands for American Civil Liberties Union. However, our detractors are constantly concocting various other alleged meeting, meanings, everything from always causing legal unrest uh, to all criminals love us. Uh, since, yes, we do defend rights of people accused of crime, and in that vein, I'd like to cite one recent controversial example that also involves free speech issues. In September, we filed a brief on behalf of Idaho Senator Larry Craig, who is, of course, a conservative Republican. We challenged his guilty plea based on his sexual solicitation of an undercover police officer on First Amendment grounds. So, yes, all criminals do love us, or I should say alleged criminals uh, love us. At my Kansas appearance, the Westboro Baptist picketers came up with yet another spin on ACLU. They said it stands for the Anal Copulators and Lesbians Union. <laughs> Many years ago, we ran a contest on our ACLU website for various other interpretations of our acronym, and for me, the hands-down winner was, "Oh, come on, lighten up. <laughs> and I obviously do try to honor that one. Uh, but the serious message is that the ACLU always defends the First Amendment and other rights of everyone, including those who use their rights to attack us and our civil liberties principles. We do this because rights are indivisible. History has shown that whenever the government gets the power to violate one right for one person or group, then no right is safe for any person or group. We are honoring the uh, famous statement by the Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire, which is also reflected in the First Amendment. You've all heard it. I may disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. Now, as I've already stressed, this core viewpoint neutrality principle is firmly entrenched in U.S. law, but it still meets public resistance, at least on first impression. And I can illustrate this through a story about my own beloved father. Many years ago, I was invited to give a lecture in San Diego where my dad was spending his retirement. Uh, that community had just experienced some ugly incidents of anti-Semitic and racist expression. I was invited out to explain why the ACLU defends free speech even for racist and religious bigots who oppose our own devotion to equal rights and why we win those cases. Now, my father came to hear my talk. He was not a card-carrying ACLU member, uh, but he still came because he hadn't heard me give a speech since my high school commencement address, which incidentally he also disagreed with. Anyway, he listened very politely and attentively. Afterwards, he came up to me and he said, I appreciate that helpful explanation of ACLU positions and constitutional law. I now understand that the ACLU is correctly interpreting the First Amendment. Thank you for making it clear to me that the problem is the First Amendment. <laughs> I don't mean to pick on my dear dad unfairly. To the, the contrary, his reaction was quite typical. Most people don't realize the importance of defending free speech for ideas they find outrageous until their own ideas are threatened with censorship because other people find them outrageous. The ACLU certainly is constantly criticized by folks across the political spectrum for defending expression that they consider to be dangerous, evil, or otherwise undeserving of protection. Although the ACLU is usually criticized as going too far in defending free speech, even the ACLU has some critics who contend that in some instances we have not been supportive enough of particular speech. And even when I disagree with that criticism on the merits, I still welcome it as contributing to the constant deliberation, debate, and dissent 
in which we should all engage. Uh, moreover, no one has ever contended that all expression should always be absolutely protected, not even the most ardent civil libertarians. For instance, there are some crimes that consist largely or even wholly of expression, such as bribery, extortion, threats, and harassment. On the one hand, these kinds of crimes should not be immunized just because they are committed through words. On the other hand, we must be very careful that the punishment does not, in fact, treat expression as illegal only or largely because its ideas are offensive. Therefore, we must draw lines between protected and unprotected speech, and in some challenging cases, even First Amendment fundamentalists will disagree among ourselves about exactly where to draw those lines. Well, speaking of criticism and dissent, Peggy and Tad and others, my, my longtime friend and colleague, Rich Friedman, uh, have told me that some critics have charged that the speakers in this lecture series have been predominantly liberal. So I have to stress that no one inquired about my political leanings any more than anyone has inquired into the political leanings of any past speaker in this series. And I say that in my capacity as a member of the Lecture Fund's advisory board. But I do plead guilty to being liberal only in the classic sense that is, I think, completely consistent with the spirit of this lecture series, indeed completely consistent with the commitment to liberal education at a great university such as this. In other words, in the sense that is reflected in the etymological origins of the word liberal, referring to liberating or freeing minds, opening up our minds to all ideas, including those that challenge our own. In contrast to that classic concept of liberalism, when you instead consider political liberalism, I and the ACLU are regularly criticized by political liberals and others on the left side of the political spectrum because of our viewpoint neutral defense of the right to express ideas that are inconsistent with these critics' own views. Right here at the University of Michigan, for example, the ACLU and I have been castigated by liberal or left members of the faculty and the administration because we have defended expression that they considered indefensible. Uh, for example, the ACLU brought the lawsuit that challenged the hate speech code that this university adopted in 1988. And we won that lawsuit thanks to a bracing decision by federal judge Avern Cohn, who was one of my distinguished predecessors in this lecture series. Yet that decision was criticized by many liberal and left-leaning folks, both in this university community and around the country. I'd like to cite another example. In 1992, the ACLU again sued the University of Michigan when the law school here censored a student-organized art exhibit that Professor Catherine McKinnon and her allies denounced as anti-feminist pornography. I described this incident in detail in my 1995 book, which sets out the feminist case against censoring any sexual expression. And incidentally, my book was itself denounced by one of McKinnon's allies as intellectual pornography. Uh, I'm citing these facts because they bear on the lecture theme of viewpoint neutrality, specifically in the context of this lecture series. Catherine McKinnon delivered this lecture in 2002. Uh, so from my perspective, any lecture series that includes both McKinnon and myself can hardly be accused of lacking ideological diversity. In the 1992 incident at the University of Michigan Law School, the ACLU came to the defense of Carol Jacobson, an award-winning artist and professor here, who had been invited to curate an art exhibit on prostitution, including her own work, which presented prostitutes' views and experiences in their own voices. Yet again, the ACLU's position was opposed by many prominent liberals on this campus and elsewhere, including the then dean of the law school, Lee Bollinger, yet another one of my distinguished predecessors assessors in this lecture series in 1992, and another illustration of this series' ideological diversity, given the ACLU's strong disagreements with Lee Bollinger about First Amendment issues in the two campus situations I've just mentioned. That said, I should note that the individuals I've named, as well as the University of Michigan itself, have been key ACLU allies on other 
important civil liberties issues. For example, in the ongoing fight to preserve affirmative action, in which Lee Bollinger has been an outstanding national leader, and in the effort to counter sexual harassment, in which Catherine McKinnon was the trailblazing pioneer. As I've already noted, one of the nice things about striving to neutrally defend all freedoms is that every individual and every organization agrees and supports your efforts on at least some issues. Of course, that also means that everyone disagrees and opposes your efforts on some other issues. And again, that kind of disagreement divides even the staunch First Amendment absolutist within the ACLU itself. Uh, the most famous example is one where Lee Bollinger was an eloquent supporter of the ACLU's First Amendment position, but where many of our members were not. I'm referring to the infamous Skokie case from the late 1970s when the ACLU defended the right of neo-Nazis to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a city with a large Jewish population, including many Holocaust survivors. Now, that case was a slam dunk winner in the courts since it turned on that core content neutrality principle. But that case was deeply unpopular among not only the public at large, but also even among ACLU members. Uh, many said, I really believe in freedom of speech in general, but the one exception we should make is for these uniquely odious ideas. And that was the idea that um, Paul referred to. About 15% of ACLU members actually resigned in protest over the Skokie case. On the positive side, though, we also gained many new members, people who said, you really are neutrally defending civil liberties, including free speech. And one of the most influential defenders of that stance was Lee Bollinger, who wrote a book about it called The Tolerant Society. The fact that almost no one is a 100% consistent free speech purist, again echoing Paul's introduction, uh, that idea was memorably captured by the longtime director of the National Coalition Against Censorship, Leanne Katz, when she said, everyone has his or her Skokie. In other words, for just about all of us, there is some idea that we consider so supremely odious or dangerous or evil. So we advocate just one exception to the content neutrality principle, to censor just one kind of expression. Journalist Nat Hentoff well captured this pattern in the title of one of his books, Freedom of speech for me, but not for thee. How the left and right relentlessly censor each other. And a writer for the Los Angeles Times also put this idea very well when he wrote, the urge to censor is the most fundamental human drive, far more basic than the sex drive. <laughs> the problem is that we all have different ideas of exactly what the just one exception to free speech should be. For many, as in the Skokie case, and for those on this campus who supported the hate speech code, for all of these people, the just one exception to neutral free speech principles would be for racist or other kinds of hate speech. For Catherine McKinnon and some other feminists, the just one exception would be for sexually explicit expression that degrades or dehumanizes women. For many liberals, the just one exception would be for expression by powerful corporate, political, and media interests that they believe drown out other voices and thus undermine our democracy. The Nation magazine featured a whole symposium on that theme not too long ago. For many conservatives, the just one exception to free speech would be for expression that undermines traditional family values that reflect their deep-seated religious and moral beliefs. And let us not forget the most widely supported just one exception, the only one that has so much support that it is a hair's breadth away from actually being engrafted onto the First Amendment as a constitutionally enshrined exception to constitutionally protected free speech. And that exception is for desecration of the US flag. We are now one Senate vote away. Uh, that uh, the last time there was a vote, and it already has the support of more than two thirds of the House of Representatives and three fourths of the state. Of course, if you add up all of these just one exceptions, they swallow the content neutrality rule, which is why the ACLU has neutrally opposed 
all of the proposed exceptions I've just cited to the consternation of all advocates of those exceptions from all across the ideological spectrum. Now, to be as thought-provoking as possible and also to be as challenging to myself as possible, just as I'm asking all of us to challenge and question ourselves, I wanted to list a few more of the ACLU's free speech positions that recently have received the most criticism from various points on the political spectrum, in addition to the examples I've already cited. So here are some more types of expression that we in the ACLU have defended that have been highly unpopular among liberals. So-called commercial speech or advertising, including for products that are hazardous to health, such as cigarettes and for Nike shoes that are allegedly produced by exploiting workers overseas. Spending money for political campaigns on behalf of either candidates or issues. Violence in the media. Anti-abortion protests outside abortion clinics. How-to information about bomb making, contract killing, and other violent actions. And the exclusion of Irish LGBT groups from St. Patrick's Day parades. Now let me cite a few more examples of the speech we defend that is especially unpopular with many conservatives. Speech by high school and college students of which school officials disapprove, including our recent widely publicized bong hits for Jesus case in the Supreme Court. Speech by critics of U.S. policies, including foreign Muslim activists who have been prevented from entering the U.S. post 9-11. Contributions to organizations that have been added to the government's terrorism watch list post 9-11. Telephone or online communications that are intercepted or chilled by the National Security Agency's domestic spying program, which a federal judge, Anna Diggs-Taylor, right here in Detroit, struck down as unconstitutional last year in a case with the great name of ACLU versus NSA, uh, and which is now pending in the U.S. Supreme Court. Other examples that conservatives uh, disagree with us on are defense of indecent expression on TV, radio, and other mass media, and online expression that is harmful to minors. Now, finally, moving beyond those categories of liberal and conservative, there's some expression that the ACLU is almost alone in defending, earning criticism from across the political spectrum. I think the preeminent recent example is our defense of the free speech rights of NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association. So by now, I hope and expect that each and every one of you should at least have serious questions and probably some criticisms about at least one of those positions that I've mentioned. That was my goal, uh, to raise your hackles no matter what your own views are about free speech principles and also no matter what your own views are about various public policy issues. Again, I cannot overstress Learned Hand's spirit of liberty, so I'm not going to contend that each of these positions is indisputably the only one consistent with free speech ideals, nor would I ever make that contention about situations where the ACLU has concluded that there is no valid free speech claim. This happens in many situations where freedom of speech is in tension with other freedoms. As I said earlier, the ACLU is committed to all fundamental rights, so we do not automatically privilege freedom of speech above all other rights. So when more than one right is at stake, we do what government officials should do, and that is to craft an approach in each specific situation that is designed to maximally protect all the rights at issue. So for example, the ACLU has not opposed all so-called hate crime laws, which increase punishment for crimes when the victim is selected based on discrimination, even though there are plausible arguments that these laws could be considered to create thought crimes. We recently endorsed a new federal hate crimes bill, which in our view will not allow prosecution based on First Amendment freedoms, but that position was criticized in a Wall Street Journal op-ed a couple weeks ago as allegedly undermining free speech. Nor has the ACLU opposed all punishment of workplace harassment, even though such harassment often consists in whole or in part of expression, thus leading to plausible arguments that such punishment can endanger speech. Nor has the ACLU opposed all efforts to protect individual privacy by limiting the distribution of personal information, even though that information may be of public interest, 
thus leading to plausible arguments that the First Amendment interests should trump competing informational privacy rights. Each of these many specific positions that I've listed, each one involves a distinct analysis of the particular free speech issues at stake, and I obviously won't have time to discuss all of them during this talk. I would be very glad to comment further about any of these topics during the discussion period, but I thought the most uh, useful way to uh, use the remainder of my time would be to continue to lay out some key governing principles about First Amendment protection for hateful or offensive expression in general, and then to illustrate how those principles apply in a couple controversial contexts. The first major problem with censoring such expression, as I've already indicated, stems from the wide-ranging views about what expression is hateful or offensive, given our wonderfully diverse society with individuals and groups who have very different ideas, values, tastes. As the Supreme Court put it, one person's vulgarity is another person's lyric. One of my favorite cartoons also captures this point. It shows three different people in an art museum looking at a classic nude female torso, a fragment of an ancient sculpture minus limbs, and each viewer's reaction is shown in an air bubble. The first one thinks, art. The second thinks, smut. And the third thinks, an insult to amputees. <laughs> I can illustrate this major problem of censoring hateful or offensive expression by citing a major category of expression that many people consider offensive for wildly varying reasons, and that is expression that has anything to do with sex. Many cultural commentators trace Americans' seemingly obsessive fears of sexual expression back to our Puritan heritage. That point was well made by my fellow Minnesotan, Garrison Keillor. He said, my ancestors were Puritans from England who arrived here in 1648 in the hope of finding greater restrictions than were permissible under English law at the time. <laughs> uh, one current example of the constant suppression of sexual expression is the renewed crackdown on indecent expression on broadcast TV and radio. This was all instigated, of course, by the infamous wardrobe malfunction at the televised 2004 Super Bowl game, and it has led to pulling and punishment of countless popular and valuable TV shows and movies. If you have not been following these developments, I assure you that you would be absolutely shocked, no matter what your own viewing taste might be. Among other things, the Federal Communications Commission has outlawed even a single use of what it delicately calls the F word or the S word, even in context when it has no sexual connotation, and even if it is part of a program with serious value. I'd like to cite just one recent casualty of this zero tolerance policy. It arose last month uh, on the 50th anniversary of the landmark decision that found poet and publisher Lawrence Ferlinghetti not guilty of obscenity for publishing Allen Ginsberg's famous poem, Howl. The Pacifica radio station in New York City, WBAI, had been planning to commemorate the golden anniversary of this historic case in which the ACLU represented Ferlinghetti, I'm proud to say, by broadcasting a recording of Ginsberg reading the poem. Ironically, though, WBAI was forced to refrain from airing Howell by now one of the best-selling poems in U.S. history. Given the FCC's draconian new fines of $325,000 for each taboo word, Howell contains more than enough to completely obliterate WBAI's $4 million budget. Since sexuality is an especially personal area, our views about it are even more subjective than in other areas. So it is especially wrong for government to take away our individual right to choose in this realm. We can't delegate to any official or anyone else the deeply personal choices about what sexual expression we and our own young children will see or not see. Throughout the past half century, the Supreme Court has tried but failed to come up with clear, objective standards for defining the exception it has carved out from the First Amendment's free speech guarantee for certain sexual expression, which it labels obscenity. 
The Supreme Court's obscenity concept focuses on expression that is offensive to the community's sense of morality. And the most famous line in the court's unsuccessful effort to define obscenity came from former Justice Potter Stewart. I'm sure you've all heard it as he candidly admitted, I cannot define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> the problem is, though, that every judge and every person sees a different it. Given our especially subjective views about the inherently personal realm of sex, this definitional problem persists no matter what type of sexual expression is targeted as allegedly offensive or hateful. For example, as I've already noted, University of Michigan law professor Catherine McKinnon and some other feminists decry sexual expression that they view as demeaning or degrading to women. To distinguish that sexual expression from the traditional concept of obscenity, they label it with the stigmatizing term pornography. Now, in contrast, these anti-pornography feminists use the term erotica for sexual expression that they do not deem to be degrading to women. How can you tell the difference, you might well ask? Well, as one woman put it, what turns me on is erotica. What turns you on is pornography. <laughs> We individuals even have different perspectives about whether any given expression has any sexual content at all. This is captured by the old joke about the man who sees every ink blot that his psychiatrist shows to him as wildly erotic. When his psychiatrist says to him, you're obsessed with sex, the man answers, what do you mean I'm obsessed? You're the one who keeps showing me all these dirty pictures. <laughs> As, as the Supreme Court has recognized, freedom of speech is especially endangered whenever the government bans or regulates speech under such vague subjective labels as offensive or obscene or pornographic or hateful. Lacking any clear objective guidelines, enforcing authorities necessarily exercise their unfettered discretion according to their own subjective tastes or those of politically powerful community members. Therefore, the enforcement patterns will be arbitrary at best, discriminatory at worst. At best, which particular expression will be deemed offensive or obscene will be completely unpredictable, and that causes what courts call a chilling effect, because no one wants to run the risk of criminal prosecution. So people self-censor, not engaging in expression that might be deemed offensive by the powers that be. And that self-censorship not only violates the free speech rights of all those who were deterred from speaking by fear of prosecution, it also deprives the rest of us of the chance to hear valued expression, including constitutionally protected expression. The unguided discretion that is required to enforce such vague concepts as offensive or obscene are also likely to be exercised in a discriminatory fashion singling out expression that is produced by or appeals to individuals or groups who are relatively unpopular or powerless. Indeed, recent obscenity prosecutions have targeted expression of lesbian and gay sexuality, as well as rap music by young African American men. And the same predictable pattern also pertains even to those sensorial laws that are advocated expressly for the sake of advancing the rights or well-being of groups that have traditionally faced discrimination, such as hate speech codes or laws reflecting the McKinnonite concept of pornography. As I have documented in a number of my publications, those laws also have been consistently enforced disproportionately to censor the views of the very people they were intended to protect. The Supreme Court's most important precedent concerning constitutional protection for offensive speech was a 1971 case called Cohen versus California. This case arose during the Vietnam War and the court upheld Paul Cohen's right to wear inside a courthouse a jacket on which he had written a message that was very offensive to many people, namely, fuck the draft. The Supreme Court's opinion was written by a very respected justice, John Marshall Harlan. Notably, Harlan was a conservative Republican who had been appointed by a Republican president. So we see yet again that strong support for freedom of speech, including for offensive speech, cuts across party and ideological lines. And that should not be surprising. After all, many conservatives want to limit government's power over our private lives. 
leaving decision about what we say and what we see and what our own young children see up to us instead of being dictated by the government. This free speech approach is not only consistent with individual liberty, it is also good for society as a whole since it permits the lively exchange of ideas and information. Justice Harlan's opinion for the court in the Cohen case well captures both of these essential benefits of protecting offensive expression, the benefit for individual and society alike. I'd like to quote his eloquent words. The right of free expression is designed to remove government restraints from public discussion, putting the decision as to what views shall be voiced largely in the hands of each of us in the hope that such freedom will ultimately produce a more capable citizenry and a more perfect polity, and in the belief that no other approach would comport with the individual dignity and choice upon which our political system rests. As I've already stressed, government may never limit speech for the purpose of suppressing a disfavored message. In contrast, the government may regulate speech if the regulation is necessary to promote some extremely important goals, such as preventing some imminent physical harm. However, the Supreme Court has insisted that speech may only be restricted if it has a tight and direct causal connection to some tangible harm that is likely to happen immediately, so that the only way to prevent the harm is to prevent the expression. In contrast, the court has said that speech may not be restricted because of some more remote or speculative harm that it might cause, or because of such intangible harm as hurt feelings. I'd like to expand just a bit on those two key points. First, if we allowed speech to be curtailed on the speculative basis that it might indirectly lead to some possible harm, that would be the end of free speech. That's because all speech might lead to potential danger sometime in the future. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes recognized this fact in an important 1925 opinion that is very relevant to today's climate with the ongoing war on terror. The government had argued that pacifist and socialist ideas should be repressed because they might incite young men to resist the draft or to oppose the US system of government, which could ultimately undermine national interests. But as Holmes noted, every idea is an incitement. In other words, if we banned all ideas that might lead individuals to take actions that might have an adverse impact on national security or public safety, then scarcely any idea would be safe, and surely no idea would be safe that challenged the status quo. Now let me briefly explain why speech can't be suppressed based on intangible harm, such as hurt feeling. That cardinal free speech rule does not at all reflect disrespect for the seriousness of these psychic or emotional harms. Contrary to the old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's wrong. Words do wound, especially when they assault some core element of our identities, including matters such as race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and so forth. The reason we do not let government suppress speech to, pre to uh, prevent these very real psychic or emotional harms is well summed up by another old saying, the cure is worse than the disease. Both for society as a whole and for individuals, having to hear offensive and upsetting expression is the lesser of two evils. Far worse is empowering the government or a majority of our fellow citizens to take away our freedom to make our own choices about what we see and what we hear and what we say. To conclude, I have chosen a quote that well summarizes my overall theme and which is especially pertinent for this forum. It is from the opinion by Judge Avern Cohn, one of my predecessors in this lecture series, the opinion in which at the ACLU's behest struck down the hate speech code that this university had adopted and which had been endorsed by another one of my predecessors in this lecture series, Lee Bollinger, who was then dean of the law school's faculty. Moreover, this passage in turn quotes another prominent law professor who taught at this university and who made a highly pertinent statement way back in 1868, almost a century and a half ago. As Judge Cohn wrote, while the court is sympathetic 
to the university's obligation to ensure equal educational opportunities for all of its students, such efforts must not be at the expense of free speech. The university's apparent willingness to dilute the values of free speech is ironic in light of its previous policy statements, which recognize that the free and unfettered interplay of competing views is essential to the institution's educational mission. In his famous 1868 treatise on constitutional law, Thomas Cooley, Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court and Professor of Law at the university's law school, came out as an early and forceful proponent of an expansive interpretation of the First Amendment. He reasoned that even if speech exceeds all the proper bounds of moderation, the evil likely to spring from the violent discussion will probably be less, and its correction by public sentiment more speedy than if the terrors of the law were brought to bear to prevent the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now for the really fun part. And I hope you get, I get some challenging questions. Yes. <laughs> please, uh, anyone wanting to ask a question, please use the microphone. And also, uh, please uh, thank, thank those people who want to ask questions as well. So one question, and then uh, we have time to ask questions. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you for coming uh, to the university. And thanks to uh, the Senate, um, Sakula. Um, Voters in Michigan will probably be facing a right to work um, ballot initiative in November of 08. Regressive forces um, from across the country are coalescing in Michigan to attempt to make Michigan a right to work state. And in essence, what that means is if you are a member of a union, currently you have to either be a member or pay a service fee and not have to be a member. But you must pay a service fee for the benefits derived. In our right to work state, you do not have to pay a service fee, but your union is obligated to represent you uh, totally. Um, so I'm just informing folks that uh, this threat to our freedom of association is looming, and it's not only an economic threat, but it's a political threat. And my question, can you um, please give us a summary of habeas corpus because it seems to me that if the government can lock you up and throw away the key, everything else is null and void. That's a pretty good summary. <laughs> I, serious, seriously, and um, I, I won't comment it on, on it more than to say that that extremely fundamental right that goes all the way back to the year 1200 is what has been gutted as a result of something that Congress passed last year called the Military Commissions Act. And uh, we are working very hard with a very broad coalition inside and outside Congress to restore habeas corpus despite its arcane Latin name. Uh, most people in the country do understand that it is extremely fundamental and, uh, and if we deny it to people that we capture that the president unilaterally labels enemy combatants, then members of our armed forces are endangered overseas. And in fact, uh, as you know, the president has asserted his power to deny that basic right to American citizens as well. So I hope all of you who agree that this right should be restored will uh, log on to the ACLU website and uh, send out letters to your members of Congress to restore habeas corpus. My name is Thomas Partridge. I'm a local progressive Democrat, a delegate to the Washtenaw County Democratic Party, a candidate for the Washtenaw County Commission, as well as the state legislature. And I am calling to your attention that the ACLU is not providing protection to senior citizens, to disabled people, to low-income people lacking public transportation, as well as handicapped transportation to the polls, 
to public meetings, including the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners meeting, the City of Ann Arbor Council meetings, the Regents of the University of Michigan meetings, as well as the Michigan Legislature. I'm calling on your organization to defend the right of disadvantaged members, the most vulnerable members of our society, to access to all of these meetings and to certainly the polls in order to express their freedom of speech. Thank you. Uh, I certainly, the ACLU certainly supports all of the principles that you have laid out about um, freedom of access to uh, the fundamental elements of citizenship, including the right to vote. And the ACLU was the prime architect of the ADA, or the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the prime architect of the regulations to implement the ADA. I don't know uh, what we are doing specifically to enforce those legal requirements here in Washtenaw County, but I am fam certainly familiar with many cases we have had around the country, including you mentioned buses. We uh, recently won a major case in Los Angeles on this issue. So what you're saying is completely consistent with our principles. And it, in terms of the implementing details, since I don't know about that, um, if you send me an email, I will find out information about that, okay? Nstrassen at NYLS. Dot edu. And I would like to continue our dialogue, but not at the cost of hearing questions from other people. So I look forward to hearing more from you via email. Are we alternating microphones here? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> my name is Esther Rubin. I'm an alumni of the University of Michigan and uh, had been um, a fervent and avid member of the ACLU until uh, the time of the Skokie March. Um, could you elaborate between the, the differences that ACLU has with the freedom of speech construct and the hate speech that the Canadian government has outlawed? Yes, uh, and, and thank you so much for that uh, opportunity to um, give you an illustration of the general point that I made during my opening remarks, that even censorial laws that are enacted with the goal of protecting the kind of vulnerable populations that the prior questioner asked about, including racial and religious minorities, even those laws have been disproportionately enforced to the disadvantage of those very groups. Uh, you're absolutely right that Canada passed a hate speech law which was upheld by a split decision by the Canadian Supreme Court. Canada does not have the strong freedom of speech protection in its constitution that we have. And as the dissenting justice pointed out, uh, that law had been used to suppress everything from Salman Rushdie's satanic verses to speech to expression that was critical of uh, America. Somebody was uh, thrown in jail for saying, Yankee, go home. Uh, lesbian and gay bookstores were uh, in every single lesbian and gay bookstore in the country uh, was subject to suppression because their views were deemed as hateful to the heterosexual majority. Uh, so the point is that precisely because we have uh, societies on both sides of the border where there are certain groups that have historically and are still relatively marginalized and disenfranchised, and that would certainly include religious minorities, it seems to me to be the last thing we want to do to hand over to the governmental institutions that enforce the laws and majoritarian values this inherently subjective open-ended discretionary power. I think we can predict that it's going to be used to suppress um, speech that many of us would want to defend on the merits. So again, it all comes back to uh, the idea of neutrality, that we have to, uh, if we want to have freedom of speech for ideas that are important to us, then we have to defend freedom of speech. Again, I can't say it better than Oliver Wendell Holmes, a freedom for the thought that we hate. Thanks. Uh, as I was listening to your speech, and especially your answer to that last question, I was very curious about a question that you may not, you may have trouble answering as the public face of the ACLU, but if everyone has his or her Skokie, 
what is yours? Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, by definition, I think you can't see your own blind spots. So um, somebody can tell me uh, what your own views are, not only of me personally, but the ACLU. I, in fact, I did give an answer to this question um, at the um, law school forum I was at, although it was an issue where I was a dissenter. Uh, I disagreed with the position that the ACLU National Board took. And it was, uh, it was one of these... Um, uh, issues where there's a tension between more than one constitutional right. And the question was, how do you strike the, how do you mutually respect both freedom of speech and freedom of religion on the one side versus non-establishment of religion, usually called separation of church and state, on the other side. And uh, I tend to usually come out on the pro or in favor of more free speech, uh, whereas that's not necessarily the uh, majority perspective within the ACLU. Um, let me give you another example, um, which it, I mentioned in my opening remarks, but it went by fairly fast. And I know from, again, I'll cite another predecessor in this lecture series, Floyd Abrams, a distinguished media lawyer, First Amendment lawyer, and a dear friend of mine. Uh, Floyd, along with, uh, on behalf of a coalition of media groups, uh, filed a brief in the Supreme Court in a recent case called Bartnicki versus Vopper, which is one of a recent series of cases where there is a, a conflict or a tension between privacy rights versus freedom of access to information. And the particular facts in that case were Ill illegally intercepted telephone calls in violation of state wire and federal wiretap laws, uh, and the illegally intercepted communications were then broadcast on uh, local radio. And it was a matter of great public concern. It had to do with negotiations between a teacher's union and the local school district. Now, the ACLU said in that particular, what we said there should not be an absolute rule that automatically privileges the First Amendment interest, namely freedom of access to information. We said in some situations, depending on the facts, the privacy right might trump uh, that, whereas Floyd and the media groups uh, filed briefs in the Supreme. So we basically came down in favor of a balancing analysis, looking at all the facts, you know, the privacy concerns and the free speech concerns in the particular case, uh, whereas the, and that's how the Supreme Court came out, whereas the media groups said, no, there should be an absolute bright line rule that free access to information prevails as long as there is any public concern, even if it's only local concern, uh, that is more important than the privacy right to be free from uh, inter illegally intercepted communications. Now, you know, to, to rebut that position, if I can, it's even more, that conflict is even more complicated because it's not just between free speech uh, on one side and privacy on the other side, it's really between free speech and free speech as uh, some of the justices pointed out, if you believe that every time you're talking on your cell phone that you might be subject to not only illegal interception but that the intercepted communication could then be broadcast, you know, that's going to have an enormous chilling effect. On your, and so it's going to result in less free speech. But that's certainly, so, you know, I don't know which side you come out on, but my dear friend Floyd thinks I wasn't sufficiently protective of free speech there, and it's a great question. And I, and I know that there are others that I'm not seeing, by definition. Hi. Hi. Yes, uh, I'm glad to be able to talk to someone involved in the steering the ship of the ACLU and is involved with that. Um, I have concerns about, on the one hand, the potential of the ACLU to do great things, but then uh, disappointment as to actually the way they use their resources and energy and attention. And I think um, what I'm seeing is a lot of attention to outer edge issues, not enough attention to core, pro core constitutional principles. And an example of this is in civil rights enforcement in the United States. Um, the Department of Justice has a civil rights division. That is, um, that they, they have, it's part of their strategic uh, plan, it's part of their formal assignment. Uh, it is to protect the civil rights of all Americans. That's the U.S. government, Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division. But in reality, the DOJ Civil Rights Division protects the rights of a microscopic number of Americans. That is the reality. And, you know, the, the wondering about... Um, 
at the ACLU, you might be more involved in trying to look at things like government uh, corruption, misconduct, abuse of power, and civil rights violations, and also trying to do work um, to try to see um, if the, the government can be a better, I mean, when you, when you understand that this country was created on, for the basis enshrined in the Declaration of Independence that is to preserve these rights, that governments exist, you would think that the federal government that reaches into just about everything, uh, a lot of things that they have tenuous constitutional justification, you'd think the one thing that the federal government would have a constitutional purpose is to protect the civil rights of Americans. And I have dealt personally with the DOJ civil rights, and, you know, it's, it's a joke. It's a trash joke. Well, why don't we do more to well, enforce those rights? Uh, that is an extremely important priority. I could not agree with you more about the problem. I disagree with you about what we're trying to do about it. In fact, um, in conjunction with the recent nomination of Michael Mukasey uh, to be Attorney General, we never take positions as to whether a particular individuals should be confirmed or not, but we did uh, take a very strong position on the um, principles that the Senate should insist that any Attorney General nominee sign onto. And there was a wealth to choose from given all of the current problems, but two of the, the four that we stressed were two that you have noted. One was the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division has become a laughing stock, and uh, many of the career attorneys, uh, the, at best, at worst, it's a tragedy and a travesty because our resources are are being uh, misspent. So, and many uh, professional career attorneys in that department have resigned. So, uh, we said that nobody should be confirmed to that position without committing to re energizing and restoring that department, that division, to its very essential role in protecting the rights for all of us. And a second major principle you also referred to, which was abuse of power, uh, that this president, uh, with the support or at least lack of opposition of Congress, I hasten to add, Congress has really been so supine on both sides of the aisle. I, I love the statement that William Sapphire, that conservative Republican who worked in the Nixon White House of all places, said Congress is engaging in undersight, not oversight. Um, and recently, unfortunately, the third branch of the federal government, the courts have become uh, quite uh, willing to not even hear any challenges to executive abuse of power on the merits because of uh, something that really implicates First Amendment issues as well, and that is the overuse of the so-called state secret privilege, asserting that even cases that have been widely publicized all over the world, we had a recent torture and abuse and rendition case, which had been the subject of a report by the European Parliament, press reports all over the world, the courts bounced it out because of a state secret privilege. So I think we really are making a major focus, those uh, very important themes that you have noted. I will completely agree with you that no matter how much we do, it is never going to be enough. You know, both on an individual level, we get hundreds of thousands of calls from individuals, and this goes to the question from the gentleman now standing at the back, uh, where there are crying civil liberties violations, a crying need uh, for us to do something, and we just do not have enough resources uh, to address all of the very serious civil liberties abuses that exist at the local level and at the national level. Yeah, and I think now we have to other respect points. other people's freedom of speech. I'll talk to you afterwards, but for the public question, uh, now it goes to this side, okay. Okay, I have two things. The first is that a hate crime, a hate crime is actually two crimes damaged under the individual because of the group to which they belong and the threat backed by action to the other members of the group saying we can do this to you too. Yep. And that's why I think it merits the, the extra punishment. That was the argument that, that we uh, accepted, although recognizing that some particular laws can be written very broadly that uh, do allow punishment based only on ideas and not on actions. So we're trying to make individual determinations about particular laws, but that's exactly the concept, that there's more harm to the particular individual as well as to society as a whole 
uh, by when a crime is committed against a victim who is intentionally singled out for a discriminatory reason. And the second thing I wanted to ask a question about I'm really not, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Other people are definitely, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been recently participating in a class that's looking at the development of Aryan thought from ancient times in through now the neo-Nazi kind of movements and white supremacy. And we're looking at a lot of these websites in class. Um, now I have a history of being active in the ACLU back in Illinois at the time of Skokie, oh. so I have a certain perspective on why uh, thought should be supported. But on some of these websites, they have lists of specific individuals with a suggestion that they should be killed. Sometimes they have their actual addresses. Some of them are abortion doctors. Some are people that are government The officials. Nuremberg File website, for example. Exactly. Uh, now, do you consider that that's protected speech? Is that the type of thing that we can somehow salute in the opposite direction in order to counter uh, a hit list uh, yeah. type of speech. Yeah, that's a, a really good um, example. And you may remember I said that nobody absolutely defends all speech, to the best of my knowledge. There are certain crimes that are committed through speech. And one of the classic examples is a threat. And, but that doesn't mean that everything that is called a threat satisfies First Amendment standards. And uh, Avon Cohn also decided a very important case that arose here from the University of Michigan that presented, you know, fa some factual situations can be very, very hard to decide on which side of the line it falls. Um, the definition of a, what lawyers call a true threat that can be punished consistent with First Amendment principles is that the speaker intended to instill fear in the particular person who is the target of the threat and, and that a reasonable person on the receiving end would reasonably feel fear. And note, it's not that the speaker intended to carry out the violent act. That doesn't matter because the harm is done if you reasonably fear that you are going to be subject to, um, to that attack. Now, in the Nuremberg File website uh, case, the ACLU did not, uh, we, I think it was very interesting that we were at, I'm sorry, this was targeted at abortion doctors and judges and others who had supported reproductive freedom. Uh, and, uh, and yet, there was no explicit advocacy of harm at all. It was invoking the notion of war crimes that were being committed, that a future generation would look back on abortion and see it as a crime against humanity. And so we are telling you the names of these doctors who, when the law changes, should be subject to prosecution. On the other hand, they you know, grayed out the names of those who had been attacked. They blacked out the names of those who had been killed. Uh, I have a friend who was one of those, is one of those doctors. I know that his life was radically changed. He had to wear bulletproof vests, and you know, his freedom of movement was enormously constrained. Uh, so that's one where there was enormous debate among civil libertarians. The ACLU, uh, interestingly enough, was asked by both sides to come to its defense, which I take as kind of a, a compliment. And we ended up uh, filing a, a friend of the court brief because we just didn't feel it was a good use of our resources to do all of the factual detailed investigation. But we just set out what the legal principles should be. And uh, the judge did give a charge to the jury that was consistent with what we said the legal principles should be. Uh, I know that some, and that's a good example, uh, Bob O'Neill, who was, of, you know, we're, we perhaps had blind spot because Bob O'Neill, who was the first lecturer in this series, is the head of an organization called the Thomas Jefferson Center for Freedom of Expression. They filed a brief that took a much more First Amendment absolutist position and just said there should be absolutely no liability for that expression. 
So you all have asked, uh, I'm sorry, Peggy, you know, my husband always says uh, I'm always the last person to leave any venue because I want to answer everybody's question and talk to everybody, but uh, I'm sure many of you are tired, and I so much appreciate your spending so much of your Friday night with me, and thanks again for your support for this lecture series. <laughs>